This is Wally Knox. Welcome to The Political Conversation. In today's episode of The Political Conversation, I sit down for a fascinating talk with a banker. Is that even possible? And not just any banker, with Stephen Roach, who was the chief economist of one of the largest banks ever, Morgan Stanley, and who then led the bank deep into business in China. And we don't for a moment talk about banks and banking as a business. Rather, we dive straight into his serious criticisms of the governance of the United States Federal Reserve System. And then we turn to China and its prospects. Roche does not see those two topics as separate. He's outlined a deep relationship between the two, and his views are not formed from some book he read somewhere sometime. He lived the issues he discusses in the Fed and in China. Before we turn to that conversation, I should make a comment about the climate around considerations of China these days. It's gloomy out there. The prevailing climate is pessimism about the potential for cooperation, so there's a run for the bunkers. We debate how strongly we should pull away from trade and mutual investment with China, not whether pulling away is the right direction. We debate how much to increase the defense budget, not whether there should be an increase. Pessimism comes easy. But my instinct is that where pessimism comes so darn easy, we're not getting something right. Roach pushes back strongly on that pessimism, but not from the perspective of a starry-eyed idealist, rather from the perspective of a clear-eyed, realistic banker. It's time to meet Stephen Roach. I'm going to dive into it. One of your recent uh, essays caught my attention, and it you wrote that China benefits from our financial debacles. Uh, I think this was one of your recent essays in Project Syndicate. And I want to go into your views on that in depth. I'd like to begin discussing the role of the Federal Reserve in dealing with our financial difficulties and creating our financial difficulties in your view, and then turn to what all that, in your view, signifies for China. You have been severely critical of the Federal Reserve for being content to run negative interest rates for years on end. But when I talk to folks about the issue, there are few people I talk to who understand what a negative interest rate is. So the getting to the basics becomes difficult in that discussion. It's pretty simple. What's your view? How do you explain that to folks quickly and simply? Well, first of all, I, I don't want to come across as a um, uh, somebody who um, really has a serious problem uh, with the Federal Reserve as an institution. Uh, my first job uh, coming out of grad school was to work at the Federal Reserve in the 1970s. And um, during that period, it was a very tough period for the Fed. Uh, I learned how to apply my trade as an economist under the... Um, the leadership of arguably one of the worst central bankers the Fed ever had, uh, Arthur Burns, who really, because of a series of mistakes, um, uh, ran a monetary policy that uh, condoned a massive buildup of inflation and took, you know, the the courageous act and the very tough medicine of Paul Volcker uh, to um, uh, address. And what I think um, was in, in engraved in my consciousness, uh, Wally, is that there were some similarities, uh, you know, uh, 50 years later in the way in which Jerome Powell, who I have great respect for, uh, uh, reacted to a sharp acceleration of inflation in the aftermath of COVID and all the disruptions that occurred um, to supply chains and other aspects of our economy that, that bore a striking similarity to stakes that Arthur Burns made in the early 1970s. And so I became apoplectic. Uh, I wrote about this um, 
early on in the COVID period, my first critical um, essay uh, that drew the connection was called The Ghost of Arthur Burns. And I argue that I, I am forever and to this very day haunted by the mistakes that were made back in the 70s and uh, dismissing uh, uh, the early warnings of the nation as transitory. Uh, and that was a word that Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen and other very uh, knowledgeable uh, policymakers used to describe the tendency uh, this time. And so the, the Fed stuck to its guns and held its uh, overnight policy um, rate, the federal funds rate, incredibly low uh, during COVID and kept it there uh, in the aftermath of COVID when inflation was surging and what they thought would be a temporary uh, surge. And when that turned out to be wrong, lo and behold, they woke up and found out that their policy rate was well below a surging inflation rate. And that's what we call a negative real interest rate when uh, inflation is well in excess of the uh, the policy rate that you charge banks for overnight lending. And you know we're still there today in negative territory uh, but only slightly, and um, you know, hopefully that will go away soon. But we are in the longest period of negative inflation uh, in modern history, and you know, as as the Fed belatedly recognized the error of its ways and moved to correct it, and as I said, it still hasn't fully done that. Um, the financial system has suffered a lot of really difficult adjustments in. Uh, acclimating itself to a more normal monetary policy. And the uh, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank is one of those, uh, a, ma a manifestation of how difficult it is uh, for financial institutions uh, to adjust. So I, I was trying to figure out how to make a, a negative rate vivid to folks who haven't lived with the issue. And I was just doing a mental exercise of saying, if I if I borrow a uh, hundred dollars at a two percent interest rate, and but there's three percent inflation, and I pay off my my debt a year later, um, the consequences to me in the real world um, are are not that I have had to pay a hundred and two fully real dollars. Those a hundred and two dollars have to be deflated, and when inflation exceeds the interest rate. Um, I can make up. I can end up making a little bit of money on the deal. There you go. That's that's the best way to put it. You are the outstanding value of your loan is being inflated more than the interest rate you are paying on the original nominal value of, of the loan. So you're basically uh, getting paid to borrow money by the central bank. It's not a bad deal. It's not a bad deal at all. Um, and I mean, there are, you know, I pause and wonder, well, if it's not a bad deal at all, what's the problem? <laughs> no, I, it's so easy to argue that low interest rates are beneficial to the economy. It allows an entrepreneur to begin. It allows an established enterprise to expand. I have a great idea. I need to borrow money to do it. The lower the interest rate on my loan, the better. And if I get a negative interest rate, oh my gosh, I can borrow a whole bunch of money, try out my idea, and even if it fails, come away with a little bit in my pocket. But there are dangers in that. And I think it's very difficult for the public to really understand that. Is there a way for you to crystallize the dangers? Yeah, I mean, if, if something is too good to be true, usually you, you find out painfully uh, the price of getting suckered into that false uh, belief. And when interest rates are too low, and, you know, in the case of the example and the reality we're using, below zero in inflation-adjusted terms, you ultimately do, uh, you, you run the risk of a couple of things. Number one, the inflation rate itself uh, starts to accelerate as, we're, as we've seen uh, in, the, in the last few years because the Federal Reserve does not have a negative real interest rate 
the type of control over the economy that it uh, needs to buy uh, its promise to Congress of price stability. You've got too much money sloshing around in the system. And the Fed didn't do this just with um, uh, its interest rate tool. Uh, it expanded its balance sheet, injecting liquidity through you know a procedure that we've technically dubbed quantitative easing. Uh, and that has added... Um, <clears throat> you know, if anything, you know, more fuel to the inflationary flame. So it's a double whammy. The final thing that happens, though, is that in a zero or, you know, too low of an interest rate environment, all the other assets that are in our system get inflated in value because they look so attractive relative to the low uh, deposit rates you get in, in, in your bank account. So asset owners rush into stocks, they rush into bonds, they rush into homes, uh, and that rush then results oftentimes, as we've seen repeatedly uh, over the last um, 25 years, a series of asset bubbles uh, that people borrow against. You know, you borrow against your ever appreciating home value, in some cases against your, your stock values. And <laughs> You, you get a dangerous confluence of an asset bubble uh, together with um, ever rising debt. And one thing we know about bubbles is they always pop. There's never a time by definition when a, a bubble uh, doesn't go to excess and pops. And then when that happens, you, know, you really have a much more serious price to pay in terms of the um, uh, implications on uh, the asset markets and the real economy that's become so dependent on, on uh, asset-based spending by consumers and businesses uh, alike. So, you know, when you're running a, uh, an aggressively easy monetary policy, as our central bank has done for a long, long time, you're basically playing with fire. And, um, you know, the crises that we've seen uh, beginning, I say, with the bursting of the dot com bubble in uh, 2001, are a very visible manifestation of how dangerous that fire can become from time to time. So I thought I would ask you to spend a moment going back to the 1970s. You and I lived through the era of the 1970s when inflation was massive and and enduring. Um, we have inflation. Uh, bothering us currently because it's been around for about a year. Um, but the inflation in the 1970s was <clears throat> massive uh, in its rate and uh, astonishing in its duration. What did it, you know, it went on for years, I guess is what I'm simply trying to say. People got so darn used to it that they were alternatively terrified of what would happen to their paychecks in the next year or so and scrambling uh, to get increases in order to keep up. Um, what, did it, what did that massive dislocation feel like to the folks inside the Fed at that time? Well, you're going to force me to go back and you know relive a, a difficult, traumatic experience as a young economist. Um, I do remember the 70s very painfully. Uh, you and I are old enough also to have lived through the 60s, but I always keep in mind that um, uh, the old adage of uh, Timothy Leary, who said, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. <laughs> you, you weren't there. So um, let's, let's fast forward to the 1970s uh, because we were both there. And I, I definitely, unlike the 60s, re remember uh, what happened then. Um, the main problem was that the central bank uh, did not believe that the inflation that was emerging could be adequately addressed by monetary policy. And this started at the top with um, Arthur Burns, a great scholar, a great um, student of, uh, uh, and writer about the American business cycle, who didn't fully appreciate the way that monetary policy needed to be deployed to deal with inflation. So the, the first example with, with that is the uh, uh, the first oil shock that occurred uh, in the early 70s. It was a quadrupling of oil prices that came um, 
in the context of the OPEC embargo following uh, the um, Arab-Israeli war uh, during that period, Burns believed that um, that was an outgrowth of geopolitical pressures brought to bear on oil markets and had nothing to do with what the Fed was doing. So he ordered us on the staff to strip out energy from the CPI so he could get a clean read on an underlying gauge that was uh, amenable uh, to uh, monetary policy action. Um, we did that. A few months later, uh, um, food prices started surging. And Burns had done a lot of detective work, and he believed strongly that um, the food prices were traceable to, to uh, a strange, unusual El Nino ocean current mm. that uh, had heated up the waters off the coast of Peru, destroyed uh, you know, a gazillion anchovies, uh, who then uh, played a critical role in um, the production of fertilizer and feedstocks that had adverse impacts on uh, cattle and pig prices in the United States. And that's where the inflation was coming from. It had nothing to do with monetary policy, said Burns. Uh, take it out. And at that point, you know, we objected. He said, what do you mean? You can't. It's one thing to take out uh, energy from the CPI. It's another thing to take out the food that people need to subsist. And he, I remember his words to this day. I was part of a group that we, he ordered us to do that. He said, if you don't take it out, I'll find someone in New York who will. And so we, we took it out because we didn't want to lose our jobs uh, and unwittingly created uh, a consumer price index that excluded food and energy. It was the first um, creation of what we now call the core CPI. Well, Burns didn't stop there. He kept taking more. He kept ordering us to take more and more stuff out to get a measure that uh, was aligned with what he was trying to do on monetary policy. He took out home ownership. He took out uh, women's jewelry because they were being inflated by speculative increases in gold prices, mobile homes, children's toys, you name it. By the time we were done, he had taken out more than half of the CPI, and that was rising at a double-digit rate. Um, in the mid 1970s, and he finally recognized he had a problem, but it was too late by then because the inflationary pressures had gotten embedded into the system through cost of living ex escalation uh, clauses in uh, labor agreements. They got built into the wage structure, uh, and inflationary expectations um, went went crazy, and it really took a extraordinary tightening. Uh, by Paul Volcker uh, to find the level of interest rates that would make a difference uh, in this um, devastating inflationary psychology. So the right. main problem of the 70s is the Fed didn't understand the process and didn't have, have the courage to do what it took uh, to um, uh, address the problem. And so we're nowhere near that today, but you know, the earlier period uh, of the post-COVID period where Jerome Powell, despite his appreciation of history and his good intentions, started dismissing these transitory uh, outbreaks of inflation, uh, was worrisome and strikingly reminiscent of the trauma that many went through inside of the Fed uh, in the early 1970s. There are also some macroeconomists, uh, I'm not going to say names because I may misstate something slightly and I don't want to do that to to someone, but there are macroeconomists who criticized the Fed's reaction by saying, yes, you're raising interest rates and that's the appropriate thing to do, but at a very slow pace. Um, it looks fast compared to other periods when rates went up, but um, we are, we're, as you just said, we are just beginning to get to the point now when the uh, real in, uh, interest rate is almost positive. La last time I checked, the, uh, the real interest rate with inflation subtracted off of it is still negative by a fraction of 1%. Um, but the direction is clear. It's, it's going to turn positive shortly. But that'll be the first time in, what, two years of Fed activity that the real interest rate would have been at all positive. 
um, back in back in Volker's day, um, I checked some of the stats, and it looked to me like he was generating uh, a real interest rate of something like five percent, a very significant, um, a very significant difference between the the Fed federal funds rate and the the inflation rate. Yeah, I look. Um... I'm one of the ones who was certainly very critical of uh, the, the Fed today by pounding the table uh, in the early post-COVID period, saying that the, the nominal policy rate, which was still being held um, at a number just barely above zero, was well below not just the, the COVID distorted inflation, but what appeared to be um, a worrisome broadening out of inflationary pressures outside of the COVID supply shock. So interest rates in real terms, the policy rate plunged into negative territory more deeply than ever, ever before that we, than we had ever seen. Far worse than was the case uh, during um, the Burns uh, and early Volcker era. So I said, you better get those rates back up as quickly as you can. I think in retrospect, um, um, you know, that advice was maybe a little too strong because, uh, you know, there was a period where Powell's Fed was uh, raising uh, their target policy rate by three quarters of a percent each meeting. And they did that for four meetings in a row. That was very aggressive. And um, the um, uh, the holders of uh, long term treasury notes and bonds uh were in denial that the Fed would do that and and were led to that belief uh, by the denial of the Fed itself. And they they took huge losses on their bond portfolios. And that's what sowed the seeds of the the problems that the Silicon Valley Bank uh, faced and uh, a few other institutions have faced as well, calling the trade underwater bond positions uh, that were um, not insured by any of these sophisticated hedges that can be put on to guard against uh, the uh, the risk uh, to bonds that occurs uh, in a very different policy environment than the one we had become accustomed to. Your recent essay reiterated your concerns about the Federal Reserve, but then it took a turn that I found very interesting, and it, it, it linked the discussion of our financial difficulties with the rise of China. And um, you have had a remarkable career. You you left the Federal Reserve and I believe went to work uh, for the Morgan Stanley Bank uh, right out of the Federal Reserve. Is that right or wrong? It's close. Um, it's close. Okay. I, spent, I spent three years out of the Fed um, at a place called Morgan Guarantee Trust Company, which is now known as J.P. Morgan. But um, that was three years. Um, and then I joined Morgan Stanley in 1982 just when the Volcker medicine was starting to work and send uh, inflation down and the economy roaring back into recovery and asset markets taking off on the heels of a, a phenomenal bull market and in interest rates uh, that now appears to have come to an end. Just in time for Ronald Reagan to declare that it was all responsible uh, he was, it was all his doing and it's morning in America and da 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 da. Um, so Morgan Stanley, uh, for folks who don't know, is an itsy bitsy bank, about $143 billion current worth. One of the largest banks the globe has ever known. And you became chief economist of the bank. Yeah, it was a great job. Uh, I started Morgan Stanley in 1982, um, 1800 people. And I think three offices, uh, around the world. And when I uh, retired um, and went into my Wall Street recovery program at Yale, uh, (laughs) the company had, um, I think, over 60,000 employees and so many offices, I can't even count them, but they're literally all over the world. All right. I have to apologize for getting personal, but I have, I have you, I have you in front of me. What what does the chief economist of a massive bank like that do in a day? What is a day like? I simply don't connect to it. Well, it was great. I mean, I I loved. I can't say I loved every second of it, um, but I I was 
able to come in in 1982 when um, Morgan Stanley did not, you know, have any concept of what it was going to grow into. Uh, and there was no economics function. There was no uh, economics newsletters or products. And so we got to create it from scratch. And uh, I didn't fully realize it at the time, but I guess I have a strong uh, entrepreneurial uh, instinct. And I developed a style. I started writing about economics that uh, was um, of interest to investor clients and corporate clients, developing products, figuring out how to put the, the dialogue, the debate out onto a new platform that no other economics team had ever used before, something called the internet, believe it or not. We had the first internet-based um, uh, uh, economic uh, forum of any firm in the world. And, you know, we got to just figure it, figure it all out our way rather than inherit, you know, a pre-existing model or set of products that uh, other institutions um, had a proprietary interest in and, and sort of wanted you to keep doing it their way. We, we did it a different way because the Morgan Stanley way uh, needed to be uh, created. The pivotal time for me came Wally, um, uh, in the late 90s, um, I built an outstanding global economics team at Morgan Stanley. We had people all over the world, and there was a horrific financial crisis in Asia, uh, and my Asian team had no idea what was going on. Uh, again, we were ranked number one in the world in terms of global economics teams, but we didn't deserve that. Our forecast was in tatters, and we didn't know what was going to happen uh, uh, to this um, uh, world afflicted by what some call the first crisis of modern globalization. So I started going out to China in late 97, having an instinct that China would hold the key to the end game of this crisis. And um, I'd been to China a few times, but I knew nothing about the place. And I started going every other month. And I figured out that China was <clears throat> not going to go down like you know, Korea or Thailand or Indonesia, uh, but was really going to come out of this crisis uh, more powerful than anyone appreciated. And I got hooked on China and it changed my life. And I ultimately ended up um, giving up my day job in terms of tracking uh, the U.S. economy, uh, bore into China uh, and became Morgan Stanley's not just chief, uh, chief economist, but first chief global economist, and ultimately ended up moving uh, out to Asia, uh, you know, maybe uh, 2007, 2008. And uh, uh, when it came time for me to think about this was sustainable, I got a teaching offer at Yale and, you know, the rest is history. Uh, left Morgan Stanley, uh, went to Yale, developed a lot of courses um, uh, based on my knowledge and experience uh, in Asia and uh, wrote three books. And uh, here we sit today. So you have a fascinating history of your your assessment of where China is going. Um, it, let me just say, I, you began as a very much as an enthusiast of a lot of the things that were going on in China, but you changed your mind at some point. Will you walk us through that change that occurred in you? Well, look, I, I have been a congenital optimist on China since I first discovered uh, that it had the strategy, the wherewithal, and the commitment uh, uh, to not just avoid um, the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s, but to set the nation, the most populous nation in the world, on this extraordinary uh, development trajectory that we've never seen for a large economy. And I stayed optimistic um, you know, in the um, in the late '90s, the early 2000s, uh, there was a critical point in 2007 that I've written about in my books, where the then premier of China, uh, a gentleman by the name of Wen Jiabao, uh, challenged the leadership in China to think about the risks that were building, even though the economy was strong on the surface. Beneath the surface, Wen argued it was unstable, unbalanced, and ultimately unsustainable. 
and they they developed a new strategy to deal with this critique. So the the model they had, I thought, was brilliant. Um, that in that it could lead to self awareness and a uh, a course correction that they could uh, adapt to the new circumstances uh, as they emerged. But um, then Xi Jinping entered the equation in two, late 2012, and I was still optimistic. I really felt that he was going to take the concept of reforms to a different level and 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 really energize the system. And at first, that seemed to be correct. Call me naive. Um, but uh, the first year of his uh, leadership, 2013, uh, he developed and enacted a very large uh, agenda of reforms that uh, promised a, um, uh, a more powerful and dynamic uh, Chinese system going forward. Uh, but beginning in um, uh, 2014, um, the focus was initially on an anti-corruption campaign that ultimately turned into um, uh, a political campaign for a consolidation uh, of power. Uh, and um, uh, the, the tact of the debate shifted more from a market-based system espoused by uh, Deng Xiaoping and his successors to one driven much more by uh, ideology uh, and the rigors of a Marxist uh, approach uh, to to governance and economic organization that then um, by the time 2017 rolled around uh, became emblazoned under the mantra of Xi Jinping thought, which now drives and shapes uh, basically all aspects of the system. And this, this made me uneasy and worried. And um, I think the final shoe for me fell, though, was... Um, uh, sort of early um, this year, we we got a report from the Chinese Statistical Bureau that the um, uh, the population, which we knew was uh, going to be declining at some point in the next several years, that decline had already started. Uh, the working age population was um, had been contracting uh, f- since 2016. Uh, but the total population started falling. And I knew from my training and experience as somebody who followed Japan very carefully that when your population uh, starts declining, the only way you can avoid a growth quagmire is to boost productivity. Uh, And the productivity uh, dynamic under Xi Jinping, where he was uh, drawing much greater support on low productivity state-owned enterprises, and then ultimately squeezed the high productivity private sector, especially the internet companies, um, the productivity outlook was was not good, not able to offset the demographic headwinds. And so I've now uh, turned much more cautious on China after 25 years of being very, very optimistic. And I have uh, a lot of concerns about the, um, uh, the medium-term growth prospects uh, in China as a result, which are critically important for the nation and for a, a leader like Xi Jinping, whose legitimacy uh, as a leader depends on his ability to deliver sustained rapid growth as his successors, uh, or excuse me, as his predecessors uh, did in the past from Deng Xiaoping to Jiang Zemin to uh, Hu Jintao. So the the issues we're discussing now on China are the heart and soul of your remarkable new book, The A- Accidental Conflict, uh, in which you lay out your view that um, ch- both China and the United States have serious misconceptions about the other and could sleepwalk, as it were, into serious conflict that neither side truly wants and could be devastating. Um, it's a remarkable book. Um, it is uh, it is not a thin tome, um, and it's one of those books where you really have to read every sentence because they're packed with meaning. Um, the your book also discusses a person who I think was is probably known to six people in the country right now. Uh, I'm, that's an overstatement. 
but uh, the the ideologist who plays a role in your book, uh, Wang Huning, um, tell us a bit about this gentleman and the role he's playing in contemporary China and why you singled him out for so much discussion in your book. Well, uh, Wang Huning uh, played a role is in um, in, in linking uh, Chinese governance uh, to Marxist ideology for um, Jiang Zemin, for Hu, Jin, Hu Jintao, and now for Xi Jinping. So he's he's a bit of a uh, a surviving uh, chameleon in that you know he can um, craft his ideology in what ways that suits the different um, uh, regimes and different leaders uh, in China. He started out as an academic, but um, quickly became much more taken uh, with the opportunities to um, apply his, uh, uh, his tools uh, and his knowledge of ideology uh, within the party structure. Uh, he wrote um, a remarkable book in... Um, in 1991, uh, based on a sabbatical that he took living in the United States. And I mention this um, now because it responds directly to the question that you asked, it's called America versus America. And it, it's it's out of print. I, I managed to get a, a, a copy in English um, from some uh you know out of stock uh, out of print you can you can purchase it today but it's it's a very it's as you say it's not it's not a very slick slickly produced book no um and the book basically is a scathing indictment of the american system uh our politics our economics uh and especially our uh, socio sociology and, um, you know, stressing <clears throat> many of the issues that we actually worry about today, um, uh, income inequality, uh, uh, urban blight, yep. and crime. On the basis of this book, that it was only a matter of time before um, America fell on its own sword uh, and would lose its status as a great power. Um, no one really paid much attention to it, honestly, uh, until uh, he emerged um, at the sort of the top of the uh, ideological structure under Xi Jinping. He espoused a, a vision that um, his his view of America in decline uh, was coming into sharper and sharper focus. Initially uh, pointed out by the global financial crisis of uh, 2008 and 2009, which uh, convinced many, including uh, sources would tell us, those extremely close to Xi Jinping, if not Xi Jinping himself, that this was China's moment to grab the brass ring as a global leader, provided it stayed on its own course of prosperity and development uh, because it can outstrip uh, a declining America. And this view of a declining America uh, is Wang Huning's signature uh, in, in contributing to the ideological clash that many in Chinese leadership circles view uh, as a, at the center of the U.S.-China conflict, the um, rising power uh, doing battle uh, with uh, a declining uh, ruling power. Some have framed it differently as the Thucydides trap. That's uh, Graham Allison from Harvard. But uh, central to you know either view, the historical view or the ideological view, is the notion that the ruling power, America, is in decline. And um, you know what I wrote about last month is that here we have another example uh, of what could be a financial crisis uh, that has drawn into question the integrity of our financial system and our banks following you know, a long and reckless period of monetary accommodation that we talked about earlier on uh, in our discussion today, uh, Wally, that reinforces the view uh, of American decline and makes the Wang Hun approach to U.S. versus China look all the more compelling. Crisis after crisis that are made in America make the Wang Huning view all the more attractive to those who believe inside of China that this is China's 
time, it's moment, it's opportunity uh, to uh, assume uh, the role uh, of a global hegemon uh, or global leader. So China itself, though, faces uh, serious issues, and you sketched some of them, um, beginning with the working age population, as you just said. It just sort of bears repeating because I think to most Americans, we think of China as massive billions of people. And uh, we don't stop to think, is that increasing or decreasing? And it is a bit stunning uh, that the working age population began to decline. What did you say, 2016? Yes, it peaked, it peaked in 2016. But and, here's, uh, the, here's the, the, the nub of it is, we have learned repeatedly that when your um your your body of prime age uh ambitious workers starts to decline that's a real problem for sustained economic growth no, no matter how big your overall population is japan uh, uh, experienced the same phenomena uh about 20 years earlier uh than uh, uh china did and japan has been struggling uh to grow uh, ever since. And um, Japan's problems were compounded by policy errors and a lot of, um, you know, other uh, institutional characteristics that in some cases are similar, in other cases different uh, from uh, China. But one thing we know about a declining working age population is um, when, when you, um, as the working age population starts to retire and age, uh, they then require a lot of support from the social safety net uh, that supports uh, health care and retirement uh, that any society needs to take care of its elderly generation. And there's a lot of material in your book that goes through uh, the fact that China has underinvested in its social safety net, uh, and that has led to... Um, uh, a real state of imbalance in the economy where uh, younger workers and their families, they save a lot, but they don't spend it uh, on um, personal consumption as we might do to excess in the United States. But that's led to big imbalances uh, in their economy. And until they face up to uh, building a more robust and supportive safety net, then those imbalances are likely to continue. And that's a very worrisome aspect of the uh, uh, Chinese strain of the Japan problem. So let's turn to what your thoughts have been on um, how China and the United States can avoid a collision course. You have very specific ideas. Lay it out for us, will you please? Thank you. Um, the book, Accidental Conflict, is a book about both countries individually, but most of all, a book about the relationship between them. And I argue that contrary to what we see every night on television or reading our newspapers, uh, that America does not have a China problem. Uh, I also argue that China does not have an America problem. I was just back in China for the first time since COVID a few weeks ago, and uh, the views are widespread that uh, China has a problem. What I argue in the book is that we both have a relationship problem that has, we've not addressed effectively over the years. We once had a very constructive uh, relationship of engagement, and there is no trust. There is no engagement right now. And so the prescription that I propose at the end of the book says that a relationship problem needs a relationship solution. And so I'm very specific in identifying three legs to the stool for the relationship uh, solution. Uh, the first one is, in fact, an agenda for rebuilding trust. Without trust, we can do nothing. Um, so I, I draw up a list of uh, action items that can be taken to rebuild trust. Some of them are easy, like uh, uh, opening consulates that both nations have closed in major cities, uh, Chengdu in uh, China, Houston in the United States. Restarting very popular and successful student foreign exchange programs, um, relaxing visa requirements. These are easy things that can be done. Somewhat tougher is 
reducing the constraints that have been imposed on both by both sides on non-governmental organizations, uh, NGOs, uh, really bringing uh, so many diverse aspects of civil society back together again as they used to be uh, in uh, building a trusting relationship. And then there are very ambitious, but so critically important issues of mutual importance that we should both collaborate on from climate change to global health uh, to cybersecurity. Uh, I'm not naive enough to say that we can go from distrust to trust, but pick the low hanging fruit first and start. And then I've got two other legs to the stool that are, um, uh, I think, of great potential uh, in um, uh, conflict resolution. Uh, the second one is uh, lower investment barriers in both countries by reaching agreement uh, on a bilateral investment treaty. Uh, multinationals that invest in each other's economies create jobs and connections and uh, that feed into economic success. Uh, instead, we have elected uh, as following the script of former President uh, Trump uh, to focus on uh, a phase one trade deal, as he called it, which is aimed at reducing the bilateral trade imbalance between our two countries, uh, which ultimately accomplishes nothing. Uh, the, the tariffs he used did reduce some of the bilateral imbalance, but um, uh, it spread to other countries and our trade deficit is larger uh, than, than, than ever. And the third leg of the stool is the one that I am most hopeful on. Uh, it's one that says we need a new architecture of engagement. Uh, we used to have meetings once or twice a year, depending on the administration in the United States, that held these big summits called strategic and economic dialogues. Uh, they were long on glitz, but short on substance. They accomplished nothing. Uh, and after the meetings were concluded, uh, the exhausted officials and participants went back to their day jobs uh, and held on until the next meeting occurred. I want a permanent uh, organization staffed equally by American and Chinese professionals located in a neutral jurisdiction, uh, call it Switzerland for lack of a better uh, um, uh, example, uh, that has a broad remit focusing on all aspects of the relationship from trade economics uh, to innovation, to subsidies of state owned enterprises, to uh, health, climate, cyber, and even human rights. But I want this organization to operate not episodically around these big summits, but 24-7, full-time. Uh, and they will be charged with developing uh, approaches to solving um, thorny policy problems, mutual problems uh, based on a common database. Uh, the secretary would have a convening power to bring experts to help solve difficult problems, like COVID as an example. Uh, we still fight over the COVID origins debate uh, that's gotten us nowhere in terms of resolving this horrific uh, uh, pandemic. But the secretary could convene, could have convened um, experts, uh, scientists, epidemiologists, public health practitioners to give us a, a, a much better collaborative understanding of what needed to be done uh, to avoid uh, the loss of millions of lives around the world. And finally, the secretariat uh, should have a dispute resolution function attached to it. So when inevitable frictions arise on uh, agreements and existing, uh, the secretary can help uh, at resolving uh, the problem. So that's my plan, Wally. Trust uh, a bilateral investment treaty and a new secretariat. It's not perfect, but at least it's a plan uh, for two nations that are headed dangerously down uh, a collision course that could res result in, as the title of the book suggests, an accidental conflict. I want to avoid that at all costs. And I've got a proposal uh, that I think addresses uh, many of the risks associated with that otherwise dire outcome. And it's strikingly different. I mean, to be blunt, the, the absolute pessimism on all sides that I hear when China is discussed, uh, even those who uh, try to follow in Trump's footsteps, 
uh, and uh, emphasize what they disagree with on China and how tough they would be if they were in the presidency, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It still reeks of pessimism about what could possibly be accomplished. It's a reaction without much hope on its side. Your proposal, and let me just throw this hardball at you, um, that stuff like that cannot be achieved by one political party in our current setup, where both parties are astonishingly weak. That's going to require, and anything like that is going to require unity in our own country, a vision that's embraced by the vast majority of Americans and endorsed by the leaders of, of both political parties. Do you see the seeds of that anywhere? No, I don't. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I've been accused um, of being hopelessly naive. I was in London last week uh, and a good friend of mine, very famous economist and a former uh, high official um, uh, in the uh, Clinton administration, who I will not identify by name, said this is, you know, I, I like your framework of understanding the conflict, but your solution is pathetically naive. And I, I take that as encouragement uh, because the view of the, um, you know, the so-called experts uh, in, in political economy and, and policy have no appetite for engagement. Uh, and if, if we don't have the vision to rethink that and the uh, a courageous leadership to do something unpopular, uh, then uh, we won't re-engage uh, and accidental conflict uh, becomes the reality of what could be the next kinetic war. And so we have to make a choice. And, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've had <clears throat> courageous leaders who have gone against the, um, the political grain. And I'm holding out, still hold out hope, call me naive if you want, that there will come a day when one of our political leaders starts to stand up, not appeasement, but for re-engagement with China. When you speak the word re-engagement right now, uh, when it comes to the U.S.-China conflict, you are vilified as being almost treasonous. And that is an absolute certain recipe for accidental conflict and war, in my opinion. Well, let me let me per permit me some optimism. I notice in the way you structure your three proposals, it starts with cooperating on some pretty obvious stuff. Cl let's just take climate change. Pretty obvious stuff that we could cooperate on. And if we don't cooperate on, wow, is there any chance that climate change really will be de dealt with? And it goes on then to avoid trade strategies that are destructive to both nations. And then culminates in the secretariat for the relationship. The first one is, uh, is it's, it's ambitious, but is the most modest of the three proposals. And I, I assume you saw that as the entry point, that is the, the idea of finding obvious things for us to work on, things that cannot succeed globally without the two of us at the table with each other leading the rest of the world have no hope of solution whatsoever. Uh, climate change foremost among them. That strikes me as something that, you know, perhaps the person wouldn't say a darn thing. You know, the, the American politician wouldn't say anything about China whatsoever. It would be all about climate change and how we're going to deal with it. And yet in it would be the seeds of rebuilding a relationship. Yeah, that's, you know, look, without trust... <laughs> There's no hope. Uh, and so I do start with um, uh, an agenda, taking little steps uh, and hopefully some big steps in dealing with climate or health uh, in this COVID era that are urgent for both nations to work together on uh, to resolve. And, you know, when we work hard <clears throat> collectively on problems, that is what sows the seeds of trust building. Uh, and I think those are opportunities that we can't afford to squander uh, as Americans. The Chinese can't afford to squander as Chinese. And the world needs us to work together and to collaborate. Climate is a natural given China's um, uh, extraordinary expertise 
uh, in building the technologies and the infrastructure of non-carbon alternative energy. They still have a hor horrific pollution problem, but they are tackling it. Uh, and you know, we certainly recognize the urgency of tackling climate change. And who better to partner with than uh, the world's largest uh, greenhouse source of greenhouse emissions, uh, who is actively moving ahead uh, in alternative energies as as China? Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who are listening, accidental conflict is a great way to learn your way into um, a whole raft of American history and Chinese history and the relationship between the two. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, thanks very much for, for coming on the podcast today, Steve. Thank you, Wally. It's a pleasure to speak with you.